Right, so the uh, first part, I will do a little recap of what we had yesterday, and then I will get into this topic in uh, more detail. Um, and it doesn't want to go. Oh, yeah, this way. Um, this is uh, uh, cooperations with a number of people Ulrich Achatz from Frankfurt, Didier Bresch from Chambéry, Omar Knio, who is at KAUST uh, these days, uh, Fabian Senf, who is in Kühlungsborn at the Institute of Atmospheric Physics, Piotr Smolakiewicz, who helped me with the numerics, who is uh, still at the ECMWF, the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast in Reading, Olivier paul from uh, Courant Institute, and then Martin Götze and Dennis Jens, students of mine from Berlin. And uh, the German Science Foundation is uh, paying lots of my bills, which I appreciate very much. Uh, among other things, we have this beautiful, wonderful program, Collaborative Research Center, Scaling Cascades in Complex Systems, <laughs> um, where we look at multi-scale problems of all sorts, from life sciences all the way to geosciences uh, via materials. Um, and we, have, we are having a lot of fun over there. And ECMWF is actually hosting me as a fellow these days. And all of this has contributed tremendously to the research I'm, um, I'm going to present to you and other projects too. And enough for the advertisement. Um, let's get going. So recap, scale-dependent models of atmos for atmospheric motions. I showed you these pictures yesterday representing more or less typical scales in time and space of the atmosphere. We knew that there's very different equation sets behind them uh, that represent particular phenomena. I told you how to approach the derivation of these equation sets systematically by first finding out what are the universal characteristics of the atmosphere um, that we can then boil down into three uh, dimensionless numbers that are the real characteristics that are independent of each other. Then we found out that at least two of them are small and one is reasonably small, which gave rise to what I called a distinguished limit, a coupled limit in parameter space. And once I have that small epsilon, I can non-dimensionalize my equations. I can identify um, the usual Mach, Fruit, Rossby, and other numbers with powers of epsilon. I can relate length and time scales to my reference length and time scales, again, via powers of the small parameter. And um, then, um, as epsilon goes to zero, it, as you can see here, the Mach number goes to zero. But obviously now we realize from yesterday's lecture, there isn't the Mach number, low Mach number equations for the atmosphere. It really depends entirely on what kind of length and time scale regime you're looking at, what you get when, for example, the Mach number goes to zero in this context. And obviously also, I hope I made that clear yesterday, um, you could not or should not untie the Mach number from the other parameters arbitrarily and say, OK, I just let Mach go to zero and keep the others. That gets you off the track of Earth somehow. Earth is on a particular distinguished limit. And all the models that the meteorologists der like and derived and found useful, they're all living on the same track in parameter space. OK, so there aren't the unique low Mach number limit equations. Um, the asymptotic results depend on the distinguished limit, which we have now fixed, and then on the scalings of length and time, and also of the initial data, which I'm going to get to next. Um, the compressible flow equations are non-dimensionalized. The epsilon appears. We do asymptotics uh, first in single scales, keeping one time, one horizontal, one vertical coordinate, and that gets us to this hierarchy of model equations that you find in the textbooks. And that basically summarizes what we heard yesterday. And the uh, picture that comes with it, or the diagram, is, was this. And I explained to you length scales, time scales, all in powers of epsilon. And on the cross points of these, you find uh, various reduced models that you find also in the textbooks. <laughs> 
hydrostatic primitive equations, weak temperature gradient near the equator, quasi-geostrophic, planetary geostrophic, Businesque, and there are, more. there are more. And today, I want to talk about this region, this blue region here, where the so-called unelastic and pseudo-incompressible models reside. And they have the specialty, as I will explain to you at length, that they cannot be derived by, or at least not in the interesting, meteorologically interesting regime, by assuming one space and one time scale, uh, or one space scale in all the directions and one time scale, and then just do standard asymptotics, you will not get meaningful soundproof equations. Unelastic and pseudo-incompressible are two synonyms for an equation set that's analogous to our usual low Mach number equations that have the sound waves removed and have the rest of the fluid dynamics still present. Uh, so they correspond to the incompressible flow equations, if you wish, but translated into the setting of the atmosphere. And now I want to explain to you how um, especially internal gravity waves play a particular role in this whole context. Are there any questions up to that point? Good. What about the puzzle of yesterday? Did anybody come up with uh, answers and suggestions of how one could get around this nagging constraint that seemingly the vertical velocity was forced to be zero in the standard limit when we just let epsilon go to zero? I heard somebody came up to me and made a few suggestions. Those are very good. Do you want to repeat them? Who was it? Was it you? No? Who, who came? You were, yes. Just me change the boundary condition. Yes, so one thing that uh, the colleague suggested was the, if I, I, I had thrown at you, I slipped it under your consciousness that I have a rigid top and bottom boundary condition. Of course, the atmosphere doesn't have a rigid top. It is open to the universe. It's reasonable to assume that the troposphere is capped by the tropopause and the layer above the stratosphere is more stable. So it's reasonable sometimes to model the troposphere as a rigid lid, but it's not really. So, and if you lift that condition, you can have vertical motions again. That's one possibility. You had another suggestion? Yes, so if you add friction at the boundary, then uh, you get a new length scale into the game, this boundary layer thickness, and inside of that thickness, the constraint is less, uh, the constraints are less uh, um, constraining, and you actually get, again, vertical velocities. And one aspect that I want to get to is the following, and that's going to play a role in, in today's lecture. Namely, if we go to these equations, again, the summary of the derivations of yesterday, Suppose in our steps of derivation, where we canceled the horizontal gradients of um, the thermodynamic variables, and then we um, went to the um, transport equation for potential temperature and concluded from there, again by applying the horizontal gradient, that the vertical velocity did not have a horizontal gradient. That came out because we have in this equation um, let me repeat what I had here yesterday. So I had theta t plus the, horiz um, the horizontal velocity times the horizontal gradient of theta plus w d theta dz is equal to zero and then I throw the horizontal gradient onto this, and that cancels this guy, and uh, this one is anyway gone already. And then here, from, from this, then I concluded, since this doesn't have a horizontal gradient, I got horizontal gradient of W times d theta dz is equal to zero, and I said, okay, therefore this has to be zero too. That, of course, is only true if this guy is non-zero. So if I have a stratification of potential temperature, 
if I have no stratification of potential temperature, so I have a neutral environment, and if this guy is zero, then the W can do whatever it wants. And that makes the whole of a difference, because in that case, if you set theta actually equal to a constant, this is gone, the W is freed up again, and then you have your requirement number four is satisfied, and actually what you then get out of the mass equation is, again with a rigid lid and everything, no change otherwise, you get this divergence constraint, the three-dimensional divergence of density times velocity, where the density has no horizontal gradient, so it's just a function of the vertical, the divergence of this beast is zero. And that is what is called the unelastic constraint. It's analogous to divergence of velocity equal to zero in the incompressible flow equations and replaces them for the atmosphere. And that's the core assumption in the unelastic model. Um, and of course here you have the horizontal divergence of the horizontal velocity times density plus the DDZ of rho times W, and that's a non-trivial statement where W and the horizontal velocity can still do whatever they want. So the stratification of the, uh, the vertical stratification of potential temperature, how do we get it into this system? I get it basically by the initial data, right? Because uh, theta is a time evolving quantity, it has a time evolution equation, so in order to describe it as part of the solution, I have to give initial data for it. And the initial data for the potential temperature, they decide whether or not the stability of the atmosphere is constraining the vertical velocity or not. Right? And so if I make it either constant or I make a weak stratification, then I have less of a constraint and then I can actually have vertical velocities and play all sorts of games. And that's what we're going to look at next. Okay. Uh, yes. It seems to me that it is the moment yesterday when you said you were anxious or stressed when you, you did yeah, this yeah. computation. We, we should have mentioned that and, 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 and found the, the trick because <laughs> you, you, were, you were just anxious at this moment. So you were cheating actually. <laughs> <laughs> I see, yeah. In fact, yeah, I was uh, somehow nervous. I don't know why. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, anyway, okay, so that's the deal. And now let's um, uh, see where what we can uh, say in, in little more of a detail about this. So now some background on soundproof models from the meteorologists' perspective. The meteorologists are interested in getting rid of the sound waves for two reasons. One reason is they don't play a role in meteorology. And second is if you solve compressible flow equations, you have to make sure that somehow the very rapidly propagating sound waves that don't play a role have to be stably handled by the numerics. And that, of course, is either, if you use an explicit scheme, very time cons consuming, you have to make tiny time steps, uh, adhere to the current condition, or you have to invent implicit schemes where you have to solve <coughs> elliptic equations and the whole machinery gets more complicated. Um, and there's other caveats that I'm going to get to later. So somehow, it, it, meteorologists like the limit, which is, has no sound waves and still has all the other processes of interest in them. Um, and why doesn't one solve simply the full compressible flow equations? I can motivate this by that diagram, which I stole from uh, Sebastian Reich and Tobias Hundertmark. Uh, from a paper in 2007. Um, they have it in a slightly different context, but we can think of alpha as being the time step of an implicit numerical scheme. The diagram shows on the horizontal axis length scales, and on the vertical axis it shows frequencies. So it's a dispersion diagram. Basically, omega, the frequency as a function of length or wave number. Okay? And you have three sets of curves. The upper curves here is one family, the lower curves going down here is the second family, and then basically this straight line is, quotes, the third family. Physically, these are very different modes. The upper ones are acoustic modes. Acoustic waves um, 
it's all in a linearized setting, so you can think of plane waves that have a vertical component of the phase vector. So the, 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 um, the, the planes of constant phase of the acoustic mode have a normal vector that points somehow has a vertical component. This is the uh, upper curves. And the uh, parameter along the curve is uh, the, the vertical wave number. And it becomes, it's, the fat line is uh, short wavelengths and the, uh, um, the, th the thin lines are um, uh, the, the, the longer wavelengths in the vertical. And notice there is a slowest um, frequency that you can achieve. So it's, it's different from, more, uh, from standard acoustics where the longer the wavelengths, the slower the frequency. And actually proportionally so. When you have gravity interacting with your acoustic mode, when your acoustic mode moves vertically, then actually there is a limit frequency below which you cannot go. And that's this lower edge here. Uh, um, it is this bulk vertical oscillation that is basically a combination of a compressible mode and, and gravitational accelerations. So that's the lowest frequency. Then this is higher than the fastest frequency of our Latta Macchiato waves, the internal gravity waves that I discussed yesterday. And that's the lower family of curves. And the straight line here, I mentioned it yesterday, it's the shallow water modes of the atmosphere or the lamp waves, where basically you assume a barotropic profile of velocity, meaning there is uh, the, the horizontal velocity is constant in the vertical, and then basically you really have columns of air being pushed uh, together or moved aside, and then that leads to a propagating mode. And in fact, it is a combination of a shallow water gravity-driven wave and an acoustic wave, because the, both happen at the same time, the compression of the column at he lifts it up, but at the same time, due to the, the, um, the mass piling up, you actually get more of a compression. So this wave is really actually moving at the sound speed in the horizontal direction. And that's why its dispersion diagram is a straight line in this uh, graph. It really is an acoustic mode. So now let's look at what's the effect of integrating this uh, time explicit, implicitly with a large time step. Right? So, say we have 10 seconds time steps, you can see here the dotted curves are the dispersion relations for the same modes, but as they come out of a numerical discretization with an implicit scheme. So that means whenever your numerical method with a 10 second time step can resolve the wave in time, the dispersion relation comes out rather accurately. You can actually describe the wave, but if your time step is too large to resolve the fast oscillations like up here, they all get slowed down to the same frequency. This is why all the curves up here get collapsed to this one, which is essentially 2 pi over delta t. And if you make a larger time steps, then even some of the slower internal gravity waves, they all get slowed down to that speed. Now, why is that bad? This is bad you, because if you have a dispersion diagram that has a frequency that's independent of wave number, it means that the group velocity of such waves is zero. The, remember, the group velocity of a wave packet is the d omega decay. It's the derivative of the dispersion relation omega of wavelength, frequency as a function of wavelength. The derivative with respect to the wave number is the group velocity. And what does it tell you? The group velocity tells you the speed at which the energy of the wave packet is traveling along. Now, if omega, the frequency, doesn't depend on wavelength at all, then the omega decay is zero and the group velocity is zero. Which means that the oscillations, when you initialize a wave packet in space, it sits there, moves nowhere, and just oscillates. And that, again, is really bad 
for applications, for example, in the atmosphere, what you would have is a standing internal gravity wave mode sitting there, and it moves up and down. But at the same time, you couple your solver with all sorts of source storms, say from cloud formation and latent heat release. And so you potentially add more energy to this mode. And then it becomes a little bigger. And next time step around, you, you call your parameterization for the clouds again. It releases energy, the mode, keep, and you get an instability. That's a, a nonlinear instability that's very typical for the combination of uh, implicit solvers with large time steps on the one hand, and then nonlinearities that you do not really typically account for when you do these semi implicit schemes uh, that can drive this non this, 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 uh, this weak instability. So this is why one really has to think of what is the right way of handling these fast modes, acoustic ones, or the, the too fast internal gravity wave modes systematically um, in the numerical method. And before you go to the numerics, you want to understand how do these modes behave analytically on the basis of equations in some asymptotic limit. Here is an example of how, what this actually looks like for a very simple example. Um, I've here simply solved the linear acoustic equations on a periodic slab. So the wave uh, pulse would it's set up such that it's a, a simple wave, like Philip uh, explained it, a wave that runs in one direction. The other one is not there by initial data. And so this pulse here should run out to the right and come back to the left and just run around unchanged. And I've integrated this on 500 grid points, so it's very well resolved with a semi-implicit scheme, a standard way of integrating these equations, and symplectic integrator, um, so it's energy conserving. But I'm using a current number of 10, meaning that this wave can travel 10 grid points in one time step. So it's a large time step relative to the acoustic mode. And then the, this pulse, after three turnarounds, um, reaches this configuration. The amplitude is reasonably kept, but since I'm making a large time step, I have some dispersion of the wave. The numerics is not dispersion free, only the acoustics is, uh, but that's still acceptable. This here, however, is the superposition in the initial data of this long wave pulse with a wave packet of the type that I mentioned earlier. Now, the group velocity of this wave packet with CFL number 10 is actually slowed down to practically zero, and you can see this. Uh, I don't have a movie here, but this pulse is actually traveling around just like here. It comes back to the other side, while this oscillation basically sits here and is just weakly disturbed. And I'm using a Godunov type method for doing the advection, which means that there's a weak nonlinearity in there so that they just do not develop completely linearly and independent of each other, but they, there's an interaction of them through limiters and things like that. This is why the wave packet gets distorted. The main message, however, is this is stationary, essentially stationary on the grid, and that's the bad effect we want to avoid. So the question is, how does one characterize a fully compressible flow at time scales that are slower than all the acoustic frequencies? What's the proper characterization in the atmosphere? It's the analog of the question in, in, in less geophysical fluid dynamics, what's the low Mach number limit? It's quite analogous question. But it's more complicated here, as we will see. And then, what should be the required limiting behavior of a numerical flow solver when it addresses a flow that doesn't have acoustics in it, so that only has time scales in it that are subacoustic? And we want to get an answer of that question analytically by first looking at the equations and not talking about numerics. And of course, as we know, the answers depend on scaling regimes. And now let's go to the next uh, slide where scaling regimes are being discussed just slightly. Um, you have to know that the atmosphere, the lower 60 something kilometers of the atmosphere consists of basically two layers, the troposphere, which is where all the weather takes place. And that's about 10 kilometers in height in the middle latitudes and it's 15 kilometers in the tropics. And here, the potential temperature is rather weakly stratified, which means that we are in a regime more akin to this, where 
vertical motions can actually happen. There's not too much of a constraint. There is gravity waves taking place, as we will see. And then in a stratosphere, the stratification is considerably stronger. And there, in fact, there's also not uh, hardly any water around. It's too cold up there. So the saturation water vapor content is very low. So basically, the stratosphere has no water. And that's why there, the, the whole situation is a lot more calm. Everything is much more large scale except for gravity waves that make it out of the gravity wave packets that make it out of the stratosphere and uh, troposphere and break up here, but that's a topic for, for, for later. So we're, we will be focusing on the troposphere and we are interested in this regime where things like cloud formation, etc., can happen. And we want to address the asymptotics of this um, flow regime and in particular related to the well-known models of atmospheric uh, physicists, namely the unelastic and the pseudo-incompressible models. So wh what are they in the first place? Here's the summary. So I've written down here again the compressible flow equations, leaving Coriolis out of the game because we are on small scales, it doesn't play a role, um, at least not an important one, so that we have mass conservation, horizontal momentum balance, we have a vertical momentum balance, and we have this transport equation for the potential temperature. Think of capital P to be um, density times theta, potential temperature, then you can combine these two equations basically to get the advection equation that I wrote down over there. So this is just a rewrite in conservation form of the transport equation for entropy. Now, in the literature in the 80s, Lips and Hemmler, and earlier even Ogura and Phillips, I get to them. Um, there is a suggestion that says, hmm, that was the, the guys wanting to get rid of the acoustics, right? So they said, huh, we know that the density in the atmosphere is basically stratified vertically. And perturbations of density away from the background stratification are really tiny. So therefore, it should be a good approximation to say that the density doesn't change much in time. So why don't I drop this term, d rho dt? Having in mind, of course, that if you have that guy dropped, you get a, a constraint on the velocity divergence, and that should eliminate the sound waves. And then when you do that, and you tweak the gravity term together with the pressure gradient term a little, I don't have time for the details, you can actually get a meaningful model that has no sound waves. It still has gravity waves and advection in it, the important processes you want to keep, and it also has an, um, a quadratic energy conservation principle. That's what you would want as a meteorologist in order to be able to do long-term simulations without having the energy blow up on you. Then Dale Duran came later on in, in the end, late, late 80s, and suggested an alternative. He said, hmm, it really isn't the density that's almost constant because we need density fluctuations for buoyancy effects, as in convection or in gravity waves. So the density isn't really that constant. What's constant, almost constant in time, is the pressure. And since the rho theta is essentially a function of the pressure, it's, it so happens that that is what the equation of state of an ideal gas tells us, we can drop the dpdt here, and we get a different divergence constraint. And that's what he suggested to use. And these, these models then were side by side in the literature, and there was many people trying out, hmm, running models, comparing solutions, debating back and forth, and there was no decision of what would be the better one of the two. And they're obviously not equivalent as, long, as soon as theta is not a constant, which it isn't, the troposphere has a stratification. It's not very strong, but it, it's present. And it's important for the gravity waves. OK, so then at the time, um, that was um, around to the end of uh, the 2000 years, 2008 to 10, uh, with, together with a couple of colleagues, we started asking, so what is the parameter range and the range of length and time scales where these models would be asymptotically valid in some meaningful sense? That's what we wanted to get at. And it's not a trivial question for the following reason. Now we do the formal asymptotic discussion. For the following reason, 
when I now call epsilon the Mach number uh, in the rest of the slides, it's a different power, but for the discussion it should be okay, um, you realize the following. So essentially the equations that I've shown you, the compressible flow equations, when the Coriolis term is not there, they host obviously advection by the flow velocity, then sound waves, clear, and internal gravity waves, and when you then look at the characteristic timescales or frequencies that come with these three processes, you can easily see that u ref over h scale is my characteristic one over time scale of advection. Then the Sound speed, I take, I've taken here the, the shallow water sound speed or the isothermal sound speed, divided by the scale height, that's the characteristic frequency, frequency of sound waves. And then the internal waves have a maximum frequency that's called the Brundtve-Isala frequency from, for the inventors of this, or buoyancy frequency, typically called N. And that has to do with the stratification of potential temperature. And if you do just quickly the dimensional analysis, G is an acceleration, so it's meter per second squared. The theta dimension cancels, and then we divide by length by taking the derivative, so it's one over second squared. So square root of this is actually a frequency. And this is, in fact, let me go quickly back to here, it's that frequency the top maximum frequency you can see with all the internal gravity modes. That's n, right? It's a characteristic of the troposphere. Here we go. Now, if you non-dimensionalize everything to go to the interesting time scale, which is the, the one of advection, you want to see how the clouds, clouds get moved by the flow, for example, then, of course, our reference time would be unity. We divide by the advection time scale or multiply by the advection time scale, we get a unity here. We do this for the sound waves, we get the ratio of the sound speed divided by the flow velocity, that's one over the Mach number. That's a large number. And when we do the same thing for the internal waves, and we pull out basically the G times H scale, we pull it out of the expression and then um, multiply by h scale over u ref, we get an expression that looks like this one here, so that's one over epsilon, times the non-dimensional stratification of the atmosphere. Right? The dimension here of temperature is cancelled, the dimension of length is cancelled, so this is the dimensionless stratification characteristic. And so in principle, when the, the theta dz is of the same order uh, of order unity, dimensionless, the internal waves are as fast as the sound waves, and if you eliminate the sound waves by letting epsilon go to zero, you eliminate at the same time the internal gravity waves, necessarily. And that was, was the puzzle, the, the core of the puzzle that I gave you. Um, so, right, that was the, the puzzle I gave you. When the stratification is order one, basically, you, you cannot have sound waves, and you also cannot have internal gravity waves. Ogura and Phillips in 1962 said, hmm, we still want a soundproof model, so what we assume is that the stratification is actually of order epsilon squared. Make a very weak stratification, then obviously the epsilon moves out of the square root, it kills the sky, and this becomes order one, and then these guys are slow, and this is fast, and you can do standard asymptotics, like the low Mach number limit. And what you get is, so you say theta, the background stratification is just a, an epsilon squared perturbation away from unity, then the dimensional stratification is order epsilon squared, you cancel the one over epsilon here, these guys are slow, this is fast, and you actually end up with the unelastic equations. Problem was that when you assume epsilon squared stratification and you look at what the values are, epsilon is the Mach number, right? So it's 10 meters per second divided by 300 meters per second, it's one over 30. Epsilon squared is one over 1,000, 
And if you therefore take a stratification strength of 1 over 1,000, the change of potential temperature across the troposphere can only be less than a Kelvin. But reality has it that it's about 30 to 40 Kelvin. So the stratification allowed by Ogura Phillips's ansatz that was analytically appealing, but meteorologi meteorologically speaking, it was not very appealing. It was just too weak a stratification. You couldn't do anything with it. So it was dismissed, and people argued we cannot use this. And this is when Lips and Hemmler came and introduced a kind of um, magic, you know, with the cups when you move them on the table, and you have, you, you, afterwards you are asked, what, where's, the, where's the coin under the cups? You never know where it is, right? So if you read their paper, they formally have a derivation, but there is a, a gap that is very difficult to find in the derivation, and, and I'm going to explain it to you. So they said, ah, oh, we, we can do it for stronger stratification, but the derivation wasn't, wasn't good, wasn't sound. Um, so what we decided to do at the time was to say, hmm, Okay, we want to keep, get rid of the sound, we want to keep internal waves and advection, but we want a stronger stratification. How strong can we make it to still have a good comparison between the remaining model that we get without the sound and the full compressible equations? How strong a stratification can we allow for? So we say, let's take a stratification that's weak, but not Mu equals two is not allowed, so it's mu is less than two, but it should be larger than one so that the stratification is still weak. Then you pull out again the mu, square root of epsilon to the mu out of the equation, you get basically one over epsilon to the power nu, and this is one minus mu over two is, is basically the frequency, one over epsilon to the nu is the, the freq dimensionless frequency of internal waves, and it's in between the sound and the advection. And now you want to get rid of the sound. Ha, mathematically speaking, that's a new challenge somehow, or an interesting non-standard challenge, because now what you want to do is analyze an equation system that has three scales in it. You want to get rid of the fastest scale and keep the slower two. So you, the problem is the slower two scales still are separated by a power of epsilon. So you cannot let epsilon go to zero. There isn't a limit model. So how do you approach this problem? And what we su suggested to do is to say, what we want is we want to write down a model that has no sound, but has internal gravity waves and advection in it. We have the full compressible equations, and we want that for balanced initial data with respect to acoustics, so initial data that have very low amplitude acoustic waves, we want the solutions of the two systems to stay close as epsilon goes to zero over time scales of that, of that magnitude. So over the long time scale of advection, we want the pseudo incompressible and compressible solutions to stay close to each other while many, 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 many cycles of the internal gravity waves are taking place. That's the challenge. So we never go to a limit equation, right? We only say epsilon is always finite. We have a two time scale model and a three time scale model, and we want the two to be equivalent when the initial data are such that this, this process doesn't play a role. That's the philosophy behind it. So let me explain to you how we went about analyzing this. First of all, what you do, you rewrite the system such that the fast acoustic and internal wave processes become sort of visible in terms of the dominant linearized terms that you, where you can explicitly see the one over epsilon and one over epsilon to the power nu. And all the nonlinearities have been pushed to the right hand side and there are order one or even smaller, one nu is, happens to be less than one, so that this is asymptotically small compared to one. So the nonlinearities of order one are here and all the dominant terms that are linear um, are on the left hand side. And um, then Didier Bresch uh, went a step further in the analysis and basically invented a symmetrization of that equation, which you also need for mathematical analysis of it, but I don't want to go into that detail here. I'm, I'm staying at the, at the formal intuitive level of how it all works out. 
and we don't need the symmetrization for that purpose. The beauty of writing it this way is that you can explicitly see that the pressure gradient term and the divergence term in this pressure equation, they are responsible for the acoustics. And the vertical advection of the mean background potential temperature together with the buoyancy term that's induced by perturbations of potential temperature, they are responsible for the internal gravity waves. And they are nicely separate out uh, just visibly by the different prefactors that scale differently in, in terms of epsilon. So what we want to do is a comparison first of the internal gravity wave modes for both the systems when the acoustics is, the compressibility is present, that's when that term is there and these are kept. And between the pseudo incompressible model where we drop the DPDT term and we also drop this term which corresponds um, to basically going to the divergence constraint of Dale Durand's model, the pseudo incompressible model. So whenever you see a red circle in the, in the subsequent slides, you know that if you drop the terms in the circle, you get the pseudo incompressible equation that has no sound, and when you keep the terms, you have the, 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 the equation set for the full compressible model. So you can immediately in, in, in your mind compare between the two, it's very transparent. Okay, so we want to do that. Then um, what one would have to do is, in, in, in trying to pinpoint the mathematical analysis all the way to the end is, you would have to first um, compare the internal gravity wave modes. Then you would have to say something about how acoustic modes in, induced by these terms and internal waves induced by those terms can possibly interact once you stick them into the nonlinear terms. That's the typical question of resonance of linear modes that can happen. Uh, look, when you, when you um, say you fully decompose the solution in time and in the horizontal, say, and then you insert linear solutions to, these, to this fast part into the nonlinear terms, of course, by the stick of Fourier modes into a, a product, you, get, you generate new modes. And then, depending on uh, whether the, um, you, you, it can happen that the, um, the frequency, the, the wavelengths add up to a new wavelength of an other mode, and the frequencies add up to the same frequency of the other mode, then you have a resonant excitation of the linear mode that, that's sitting here, and you have to exclude that. If you have a resonance, um, oh, you, you don't have to, but you, you would like to exclude it. If you can exclude resonances, then life is a lot easier, mathematically speaking. If you have resonances, you have to do a special analysis to control what happens with the resonant modes when they interact. So this is a question we have to ask. So can acoustic modes and internal waves interact with each other? And um, then if you happen to find out they cannot, and we did find they cannot, then you have to control the nonlinearities here for, the, uh, for all the data that are non-acoustic, uh, and that's sort of the, the coarse grained steps of, of the analysis that one would want to pursue. So the first thing to do is look at the internal gravity wave modes for the fast linear system, and in order to make notation a little less heavy and get rid of most of the epsilons here, we do a rescaling of time, basically including the epsilon to the power nu in a new time variable, so that goes away. And then we rescale the pressure, which has the um, epsilon power here, to basically a different variable, we call it pi star, and then the epsilon goes away here as well, and the only place where we have an epsilon left will be here on this transparency. So this makes it, this is the equivalent linear system, just with different variables but it makes it very clear where the acoustics is located, namely at that point. Okay, now you focus on the problem that's really the nagging one in this case. The theta hat was the background stratification of potential temperature, so is theta bar, which is one plus epsilon to the power mu times something. And the pi bar here is the background pressure distribution. And they are all depending non-trivially on the vertical coordinate. So this is a non-constant coefficient linear system. And for non-constant coefficient systems, when the coefficients are general functions, they are smooth, but we don't know much about them. They can be more or less arbitrary. 
it's very difficult to, to do the control of, of even Sobolev norms of the solutions. So that's a challenge to go after. And um, we are less ambitious to, in the first place. We just want to find out, suppose we compare internal gravity wave solutions for the full system and for the system without the stern. Do they look similar? Under what conditions do they look similar? Conditions on the power mu here um, in the compressible term. Well, what we do is we decompose the solution in vertical eigen modes. So we say solution ansatz is horizontal traveling waves um, multiplied by a combination of vertical structure functions for potential temperature, horizontal velocity, vertical velocity, and pressure. And the goal is to find the frequency omega, which is an eigenvalue of the problem, and the, an equation for the vertical structure functions um, so that we can actually do a spectral expansion of the, of the linear, fast linear solutions. Well, if you do everything and you eliminate all the variables except for the w, you actually get um, a very nice equation. Here is the eigenvalue. Um, it's obviously a linear equation in the vertical velocity term. And it has two derivatives in the first term here, and it has no derivatives here. And if you drop the epsilon to the power mu, you find out it's a regular sturm liouville problem for, eigen, for the eigenvalues. It, the equation is called the Taylor-Goldstein equation in meteorology, and in the pseudo-incompressible case with the red term, red circle term dropped, it's a regular sturm liouville problem, Every, everything is known about it, and so we know we have a nice orthogonal set, a normalizable orthogonal set of eigenfunctions, ver vertical structure functions for W, we have a corresponding set of double eigenvalues, plus minus um, a certain value of the frequency are the eigenvalues, and they are all nicely separated, and they increase, uh, the one over omega squared increases um, with the mode number squared. So if i or k is the mode number of the eigenvalue, then one over omega squared increases like uh, k squared, or omega decreases like one over k. So the frequencies become slower and slower when the wave num the mode number uh, becomes bigger. So all of this is known, this is nice. And now the question is, what happens if you keep the term? Obviously, when the term is not there, all the omegas we get, they d d don't depend on epsilon, so that they're all order one terms in the limit as epsilon goes to zero. Suppose we assume order one here for omega in the compressible case, but we basically want to find eigenvalues that are close to the ones when that term is not present. So we basically try to see whether there is compressible modes that are small perturbations of the ones we found for the incompressible, pseudo-incompressible one. When, when you do that, so omega lambda squared over c squared is order one, you actually find that this is a nonlinear version of a sturm liouville problem. Um, and the theorems about the regularity of sturm liouville problems as in their dependence on the coefficient functions, there's a couple of theorems about that. Uh, th this, they tell you that if you slightly perturb the coefficient functions, you actually get slight perturbations of the frequencies and the eigenmodes. And that can be used in an iteration argument to say, to prove rigorously that the eigenvalues for the compressible system are close to those for the pseudo-incompressible system by no more than epsilon to the power mu. That's nice. And the same is true for the eigenfunctions, the vertical structure functions. So the conclusion is the pseudo-incompressible and the compressible eigenmodes and eigenvalues are close by order epsilon to the power mu. So they are actually similar. And they become more similar when epsilon goes to zero. But there is a, a slight problem left. We know that the frequencies also differ by epsilon to the power mu. Now remember, we wanted to follow the solutions over the slowest timescale in the problem, over advective timescales. 
which means that the internal wave modes would make one over epsilon to the power nu oscillations. Many, many, asymptotically many oscillations. And we want the solution at the end, after the advective time, to still be phase accurate. Right? So if the eigenfrequency is slightly different, then cumulatively over many oscillations, the phases would differ from each other. But we want to insist that even after the long time of advection, the phase accuracy is still given asymptotically. And that actually puts a constraint on mu, on the power that we have assumed for the stratification strength. And what we get magically is two thirds. So mu has to be bigger than two thirds and then we are fine. So that's far away from two, which was the Augura and Phillips bad case. It's much nicer. And in fact, if you take the stratification strength that comes with this limit value of epsilon to the power two thirds, then in um, dimensional terms, the stratification across the troposphere can be of the order of 40 Kelvin, which is what you observe. So somehow we, we at least can say the pseudo-incompressible model produces solutions for the internal waves that are close over advective time scales to the compressible ones if the stratification strength is at least as weak as epsilon to the Mach number to the power two thirds um, or weaker. So that's a first corroboration on the basis of formal arguments that in fact um, the pseudo-incompressible model makes sense, both mathematically speaking, as well as physically, meteorologically speaking, and it gets us rid of this Ogura Phillips criticism. By the way, um, I've shown the argument here for the pseudo-incompressible model. You can do the same thing for the dropping of the density time derivative, and it so happens that in this regime, both models are, they have the same order of magnitude of the error, they just make the error in different equations. So basically, unelastic and pseudo-incompressible, there is no debate. They are equally good in this design regime of, of models. And here is a interesting little twist on practicalities. We solved by using um, vla Ledoux's um, MATLAB solver, strom liouville solver, Matslis, which is a marvelous little uh, open source a program to actually solve the sturm liouville problem. And we compared the unelastic pseudo-incompressible and the compressible eigenmode here for a particular set of length scales and, and uh, horizontal wave numbers. And it turns out that the errors we get are much smaller than epsilon to the power mu, formally speaking. So epsilon is a tenth. Epsilon to the power two thirds is then something like an eighth or so. And this is the difference between those guys is 10 to the minus three. So the, the internal waves come out astoundingly accurately against the coarse grained expectation. And the reason behind that is that the, the upper estimate for the frequency that we took, the n, or that, that you get formally from the asymptotics, is an overestimation of the real frequencies whenever the, 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 the vertical wave number is relatively large. So the waves actually move a lot slower than n in practice, and that makes the, the, uh, the motion be much farther away from any acoustic frequency than, uh, than you would have it with, with the, the maximum frequency of n, and that's why um, in fact, the approximation is much better than one would expect on formal grounds in this case. Um, and that is a movie I wanted to show you of a, an honest-to-goodness internal gravity wave. And Adobe was nice enough to break their software, so it doesn't show in the PDF anymore. Um, but here is what you can see when you do the following. You, basically have a flow that comes over a 60 kilometer high atmosphere with a speed of 10 meters per second flowing this way. And there's a tiny little hill of like 500 meters height and three kilometers in width, like a one over one plus distance squared um, hill. And it in 
it's in a stratified atmosphere. The contour lines here are contours of constant potential temperature. So you see the stratification explicitly. And then you see a wave pattern develop. It's really a nice wave packet that is, gets generated by this, by this hill. And it moves vertically. And after a while, you can see that the, uh, the, the contours of potential temperature actually become vertical. And shortly after, it's like breaking waves on the beach that we saw in Philippe's talk. Basically, you have a buoyancy unstable situation, and then the waves break. That, in fact, is an extremely important process uh, that happens in the atmosphere all the time. Now, orographic perturbations, <laughs> create some innocuous, very small amplitude internal waves near the ground. The internal waves are energy preserving, however, so that the wave packet takes the energy and propagates it up here. Now, the energy is density times velocity squared over two, that's the kinetic energy, plus density times the potential temperature perturbation, that's the potential energy, uh, and the sum of the two is constant. Both are multiplied by the density. The density drops from here to 60 kilometer height by a factor of um, 1 over 90 or something. So basically, there is an amplification in velocity squared and potential temperature perturbation of a factor of 90. So that means as the wave travels upwards, it keeps its energy, but since the density is going down, the energy goes into large velocities and large excursions. And that's why ultimately all these waves break high up in the stratosphere. When they break, they, de they deposit energy and in particular momentum up there, and that's what drives the stratosphere. They induce a mean flow in the stratosphere that really is responsible for lot of effects, lots of effects in climate. They push air systematically to the poles, and there it comes down again, and things like that. So it's really this wave breaking process that's extremely important and needs to be, is, is, is a whole own research field with, with a lot of intensity in meteorology. And in this context, these models that we are talking about here, the pseudo-incompressible and unelastic models, are used a lot because they are robust. They don't have to worry about interacting of this process here with sound waves, et cetera, et cetera, on a numerical basis. Yeah, that was just that. And going back to here, let me see where I stand. Yeah, that's, that's another simulation um, that shows um, a comparison of this breaking wave um, process after a certain time. Uh, and there's three numerical integrations. The pseudo-incompressible is up here. The, acoustic, the compressible solution with the same time step for, as the pseudo-incompressible one, so it's the current number for advection is order one. It's an implicit method, semi-implicit method, so it can do large time step. And then here is the same situation with a compressible solver, but with small time steps, so even the acoustics would be resolved. But you can see, you see, don't see any difference. The models actually produce rather the same results for all practical purposes in this, in this setting. And here is another comparison for a, a test case that's very much uh, used in metrology for testing the basic features of a numerical code. It's a cold bubble of air that's placed in a quiescent environment um, that's not stratified, it's, it's neutral, so d theta dz is zero. Then the cold bubble get, gets basically pushed down by gravity. It squashes near the ground. It creates a density current that runs horizontally. And when you compare here the red and the blue curve, which are the compressible and pseudo-incompressible solutions, they basically run on top of each other. Again, hardly to be distinguished. The dashed line here is a twist on the equations that doesn't work out so well. And in the paper this, uh, here in 2014, we, we worked out these differences between two different versions of eliminating the sound. And it so happens that Dale Durant's original model, the pseudo-incompressible one, is, is the best one in this context. And now, what time, uh, what time is it? I have still half an hour to go. I actually suggest we take five minutes of a break.
because uh, people are falling asleep. And then I take another 20 minutes to give you a, a brief intro into some steps towards a rigorous, making everything rigorous that I've been saying that I've been working with Didier on for, for a while. Uh, let's take five minutes of a break and breathe some air. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Let's go back to the to the talk for 20 minutes. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> right. Please. Now, steps towards saying something rigorous here. So basically, what one uh, one approach to um, showing that the full nonlinear system actually has um, uh, solutions that you can control in some Sobolev space is to go as follows, to proceed as follows. You first try to just look at the linear system and prove that um, solutions, if they start in a certain Sobolev space with smooth enough functions, the solutions stay in that space. And then typically what you would like to have is the uh, smoother, the, the initial solutions, they stay all the smoother. And then if you can go high enough with the index of the Sobolev space, then you can hope that if you take, uh, start a, a Picard iteration, an iteration scheme where you first take a linear solution, then use that linear solution in part of the nonlinear terms here, and create a new linear system that consists of the fast part and the linearized uh, nonlinear part, that that system um, is again nicely behaved, provided the product of two of these Sobolev space members doesn't get you out of a, a, a controlled, um, for example, continuous Set, a, a set of continuous functions. <clears throat> so the first thing you want is control of derivatives of the fast linear system in that kind of procedure. And that's the first big obstacle in the setting that we are in because if the coefficients in your <clears throat> PD, linear PDE system are not constant, then one doesn't have a general procedure of proving Sobolev regularity for the linear system. <clears throat> That's a very big challenge. It's, there's no general answer to this. And so we try to do something with the techniques we have developed so far on that. <clears throat> um, it's actually easy to show that this fast linear system, when you drop these terms, keeps a certain quadratic energy constant. So it's a sum, a weighted sum of the square of the velocities and the square of the perturbation potential temperature. Integrated over space with certain coefficients that only depend on, uh, 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 on, the, on the stratified background, that energy is conserved. So that means you have a, a weighted quadratic uh, L2 norm of, of the solution is actually constant in time. That's great. That's the best you can hope for. Then, since the coefficients are non-constant but only depend on the vertical, on z, but not on x and not on time, 
you can immediately show that by, by taking time derivatives of the entire equation set, that the time derivatives um, also have the same quadratic norm preserved in time. So therefore, you can go to arbitrary high time derivatives and you get L2 control of all the time derivatives. It's, it's easy. And for the horizontal derivatives, the same holds because the horizontal derivatives do not act on the coefficients. So therefore, if you, if you throw a horizontal derivative on this, you basically get the same equation set, but for the horizontal derivatives of the solution. Hence, all the horizontal derivatives are also controlled in, all the, in, in L2 with a certain weight. The problem comes when you take vertical derivatives, because then the, you, the vertical derivative applied to, to this term basically generates a, a term that has a factor of 1 over epsilon to the power nu in front of it, and you cannot intelligently combine again to basically get a DDT of some sum of squares of 0. It just doesn't work out, at least not for general functions. Uh, that we want to allow for, where you make no assumptions about, except a certain smoothness. So how to deal with that? Well, we said, we, we did all this hard work of going through the uh, uh, vertical mode decomposition, the spectral expansion and the sturm liouville problem. Why don't we use that? What can we milk out of this ansatz um, in terms of control of vertical derivatives. That's what we went after. So we go again, we do the vertical mode ansatz with horizontal traveling waves. We stick it in, we get the Goldstein, Taylor Goldstein equation, or let me focus on the pseudo incompressible case first. We get the regular Sturm Liouville problem um, for the vertical velo velocity structure function. Now, it so happens that regular sturm liouville problems have very nice features in terms of what I said earlier. They have a, um, a set of orthogonal eigenvalues, which means that the, an, an L2 inner product of vertical mode um, I and, and J, no, um, a K and L, for the same wave num horizontal wave number lambda I, um, the wave numbers k and l, they are uh, orthogonal to each other with a certain, under a certain weighted scalar product, where the weight comes from the right-hand side. It's the coefficient here, phi, phi times n squared, which is a function of z. If you take that as a weight in a scalar product, then they are actually orthogonal. Ah, beautiful. So that, how do you get that? You basically multiply by uh, a, a, this equation for the case mode with WL, and then you do the integrations by parts, and you find out the left-hand side drops out, and bingo, you have the orthogonality. This, at the same time, also means that the left-hand side has a similar orthogonality property. If you do the same calculation again, and you know the right-hand side has that orthogonality, you find out that, in fact, a weighted H1 norm of WK and WL is also orthogonal under a different weight for the scalar product. Ha, ah, beautiful, now we have L2 control of W and H1 control of W. Only one of them is normalized, so that this is actually a, a delta, the Kronecker symbol, and here you have the Kronecker times a certain factor, which we get back to later on. But that's great, so we have um, L2 and H1 control for the vertical velocity structure function in the pseudo-incompressible case. Then we move on and um, <clears throat> um, this was the orthogonality property which we now want to use in, the, in controlling the L2 norm of the full solution. So the full solution is an expansion in terms of eigenfunctions, as I said before with certain coefficients w, i, k, which are the amplitudes of each, each of the eigenmodes in the initial data. You stick it into your weighted L2 norm under which the eigenfunctions are orthogonal. You do the calculations. You orthogonality drops the double sum, collapses to a single sum, and then basically you get that the, uh, the sum of the w, i, k squared, the amplitude squared, is a constant, and so therefore that's analogous to the energy conservation that I mentioned earlier. Beautiful. 
We, use, we do the same trick now with the H2 scalar product, uh, H1 scalar product. So we take a gradient of W multiplied with itself with the other weight. And here we know that the H1 type of product of the vertical modes is orthogonal. You do that magic again and you come out. This is also constant. So in fact, not only are, are the structure functions themselves um, orthogonal, you actually get control of the a complete control of the L2 and H1 norms of the vertical velocity full solution period in the, circ in the uh, pseudo incompressible case. Great. Next, you can actually push this by using the Sturm Liouville equation again and again. You can push this with two higher derivatives by simply saying I can replace W, the second derivative of W, now through the Sturm Liouville equation by the first derivative and W itself, I have L2 control of both of these guys, and so therefore I can actually conclude that there's L2 control of the second derivative, and you repeat the process and you can pull it up, push it up to high norms. So that means we actually get um, HS control of the vertical velocity itself. Ha, great. What about the horizontal velocity, potential temperature, and the pressure field. We haven't said anything about them yet. We know, however, from the expansion and our structure functions that there is a relationship between the vertical structure function for W and those of U and theta. They are not independent of each other. Remember, in this ansatz, we have to get from here, sticking into this, to the sturm liouville equation, we had to eliminate step by step these relationships, uh, the, these other variables in favor of W star. Basically, this is what is called polarization conditions in meteorology. It's the relationships between all the variables in an eigenmode that we know explicitly from these calculations when we do the elimination to get, go from here to there. So we use these in the next step. Here is um, the polarization conditions, and then we can, in fact, proceed to express the vertical structure function for theta in terms of that for W, and so we can do for U and pi, and basically we get expressions that are interesting um, uh, re-expressions of all the other components in terms of vertical velocity. Now let's look at what we can say about the potential temperature perturbation structure function when we use this relationship. Well, you basically take theta divided by d theta bar dz, so basically this expression, and now that has an expansion in terms of eigenfunctions of w with a different weight here for the, for the amplitudes, but otherwise all the game goes through. For example, if you take horizontal gra or gradients of this and you use the weighted nor H1 norm that under which the vertical structure functions are or for W are orthogonal, you can pull it again and you get a constant. And so you have in a different weight of the norm, you have again control of derivatives of the potential temperature. Very good. It's di more difficult for U because the U uh, vertical derivative of U is a combination of two terms where the omega appears again. And if you now naively take this expression, stick it into, um, say, you want to control the vertical derivative of U, the L2 norm, you don't find a weight so that everything adds up and um, you can use the orthogonality of W. One of these terms always is in the way, and that means you end up with a triple sum, um, with, a, with a, a triple sum here, that you cannot collapse to a single sum. And that's where the real difficulty is with the non-constant coefficient uh, linear systems in general. That's what happens all the time. And uh, these double sums you have to somehow control. We have actually two ideas of doing so. This first idea here is actually important when we later go, as when we later went to the compressible system that I will not discuss further. But what you can show is that um, basically think of um, a double sum being produced by taking uh, a matrix um, of coefficients, 
and you basically sum over all the matrix entries. If, if you collapse it to a um, diagonal matrix, then the double sum collapses to a single sum. In this case, it looks like the matrix is fully populated, so you have the double sums. If, however, you can prove that the matrix is concentrated around the diagonal and the coefficients decay rapidly enough away from the diagonal, you can actually make an argument that, again, you have the equivalent of a collapse to a single sum, which is equivalent to saying that for high, wave num uh, high mode numbers, k or l to infinity, away from the diagonal, um, you have some kind of cancellation effect. And that you can actually show because the Asymptotically, for large k, locally, this vertical structure functions look like sines and cosines. And for different k and l, the sine and cosine is orthogonal. And you can use that in a WKB type asymptotic argument to show that, in fact, away from the diagonal, the coefficients decay rapidly enough. You get a collapse and you go through. That argument is actually very important uh, and cannot be replaced by what I show next uh, in the compressible case. Here, however, we have an, an even easier approach. Basically, du star dz is a sum of two terms. And we simply call this guy du star 1 dz and this guy du star 2 dz. And we control these u1 and u2 separately in different weighted norms. But since basically the weighted norms, when the weights are all order 1 functions that don't go to 0 somewhere, they are equivalent, you get control of use du, du star dz itself because you control them separately in different L2 norms with order one weights everywhere. So that actually gets us control of all the der vertical derivatives of all this, the structure functions very nicely. And this gives us, in the end, HS control for the full uh, pseudo-incompressible fast system. And that's how far I wanted to drive this. I promised 20 minutes and I managed. Um, what we have been able to show to also is that in the, if you look at the compressible system and only the internal waves, you can again show HS control. But unfortunately, the, acoustic, the, the compressible system also has acoustic eigenmodes, which you get if you take the, oops, let me go quickly. No, no further. Here, if you go here and you do not assume that this, this coefficient here, or this term, omega squared lambda squared over c squared is order one, which is reasonable when you look at the internal ways. But now you let this be large of order one over epsilon to the power mu. Then you find another set of eigenvalues, and that's the acoustic ones. And now you have two sets of eigenmodes around, and you have to prove that the cannot resonantly interact through the nonlinear terms um, that I discussed here. So if you do the Picard iteration, you stick both the acoustic and the um, internal wave modes into the nonlinear terms, you have to prove they cannot resonate. And it so happens that they cannot. The, the lowest frequency of the acoustics and the fastest frequency of the internal waves, they, they separate asymptotically as epsilon goes to zero. And that means they cannot resonate with each other. So that's another result we have. And I'm almost at the end here. Um, so we, we, we can rule out resonances between the acoustics and the internal waves. We have control of derivatives for the compressible and the pseudo-incompressible system. Um, and um, the other stuff is for the next SEMROX uh, <laughs> that I'm lecturing on. <laughs> uh, so we are on our way. We have been so doing so for a while. Uh, but we made big progress when I had the f favor of visiting DDA for a month last year. That was very nice. And I motorcycled all the way in, in the Savoy. And uh, <laughs> I'm uh, very happy about this cooperation. And um, with that, I. I'm, I'm done for today. Thank you. Questions? Yeah.
in your theorem, I don't understand how you handle the nonlinear terms because they will mix all the modes, and so. The, basically, it's this, the the usual uh, way of of doing the. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, the, 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 the iteration approach. So you start with a, long, with a linear solution. Yes, but it's right. quasi-linear terms, so you cannot really treat them as a... As a you, you need at some point some energy estimate, so you need some... Yeah? Some, uh, so you need to have some uh, vanishing between your coefficients and your stomial expansion. You need some... Uh, there is a mixing of modes, so you need some... Uh, other uh, condition on the coefficients, uh, decaying coefficient. So you, you cannot really, it's not like a, a similar term where you would have a f of u, it's, you have some derivatives. So how, yeah. I don't see how you can handle them just with a linear estimate on the, on the. No, this is only a first part, but the, the procedure works as follows. If you have high enough con uh, Sobolev control for, for, the, for the linear solutions, and you can then show that if you take any of the linear solutions as a coefficient of the quadratic term, and you look at the remaining linear system, that again, you of course have to do, pull the crank again and show HS control for that. And if you then can rule out resonances, then basically you are done, as far as I understand this. Yes, sure. <laughs> Other questions? I have I have one. So the when you use this storm, you will to have the this uh, HS estimate for yes. for the, the Ws. So the 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 scalar products are not the, the first one is the Kronecker. Okay, you have one, yes. and then you have a constant. Yes. Yes. And how does this evolve if if you if you increase with the with oh, yeah. S? Oh yeah. And, so and yes. Don't you have to control that in order yes. to be sure? Yes. Let me let me show you that. That's true. And it's all a matter of the initial data. Um, so here, I, for example, when I discussed the control of uh, the derivatives of the potential temperature, basically the fact that in the H1 control, uh, H1 orthogonality, I have not a straight Kronecker, but I have these prefactors, that shows up here. And the, the higher the derivatives go, the more powers of the eigenfrequencies you get, the higher powers you get in the denominator. And as I mentioned earlier, omega k goes to zero, like one over k. So this, for large k, blows up on you. So if you want control up to a certain level of derivatives, you get a constraint on the initial data, meaning on the coefficients uh, w1k. So you have to require the initial data to be still uh, sum up to something uh, under this sum to sum up to a finite value, so they have to decay more rapidly than omega to the fourth in this case, or omega to the x in this case. But that simply means you have to start with smoother initial data in order to stay in that Sobolev space. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Okay, thanks again. Yep.